them lined up for you. Um, John Dean and Josefa Domingos are uh, great friends, not only of our foundation, but they're also great friends of the community here, the Parkinson's community. Every time we've asked them to help us out on something, they jump right in. So we really appreciate everything they do for us and all the work they're doing for us also. Uh, John and Josefa are going to talk about a project that they're working on that we're uh, kind of partnering with them. Um, the program hopefully will become a really big deal at some point um, as other organizations jump on and help them get this going. So I am going to turn it over to John and Josefa. I understand we have some uh, visitors from Portugal on with us today also. So this is truly an international webinar. So take it away, John and Josefa. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Great talking with the group. Uh, you guys have an awesome organization. You're always doing cool stuff. And we're really glad to be part of this project. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let me say hello to my Portuguese people. Bom dia. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, we, we at five o'clock here in Portugal, so it's later. Time for coffee and cakes, or is that a little bit later? Yeah, no, yeah. it's right now. It's five o'clock tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so sh shall we get started with the slides? Yeah. I'm going to pull the slides up, guys, and, and if you have any questions, I don't know if you guys put them in chat or we'll, we'll get them near the end of the session. Okay, so let me pull up my sharing the screen capabilities. Yeah, um, if folks have questions as you're presenting, you can put them in uh, chat. And then if there's enough time at the end of the presentation, maybe we can unmute and folks can just talk live. There we go. Need to just make a minor adjustment here. There we go. I think we're copacetic now. Okay, uh, so again, Josefa and I are, are uh, therapists that specialize in the treatment of Parkinson's. She's a physiotherapist, which is what the rest of the world calls physical therapist. And I'm a speech language pathologist or a speech therapist. Um, so, Zhu, I'm, I, I... Yeah, can we pass on to the next slide? Surely. Yes, I uh, will just jump right into, I would say, um, the motivations behind this project itself so that it will, it will make sense to us. In a, in a time that where we can see so many options for exercise in Parkinson, as you can see there, we have boxing, pickleball, tai chi, uh, choir, qigong, uh, ping pong. The, it is, I would say it's a good problem for us to have, definitely. So options are good. I think what comes to mind next is what specific uh, features must an exercise have in order to influence you know, people's choices? How do people choose? So lately, uh, we see a lot in uh, people asking in webinars, um, which ex exercise should I do, right? It's, it's a very common question. And I'd say the most um, frequent answer that I hear is usually any exercise is good, do what you enjoy. You all agree? But one must really ask ourselves, if any exercise is good, why are we investing so much time and resources in exercise research and educational programs for health and exercise professionals, right? There has to be something more to it. Now, to be fair, when we are comparing it to nothing, and I think this is basically where this answer is coming from, if we compare it to nothing, then of course, any exercise is better than nothing, right? Our concern here is really about if people don't do it, then it doesn't serve for anything. But I'm sure you all will definitely agree that besides enjoying an exercise, you will also enjoy having results. I mean, that is, after all, the reason why you're doing it. So, and, and I think we also would, would definitely agree that if an exercise truly addresses, you know, a specific problem that you are dealing with, the greater the probability of you actually doing it. So if people are struggling with, let's say, moving around in bed, getting up from a couch, passing through a doorways, or any other daily challenge, you know, according to the principles of motor learning, things that we are researching, the closer the exercise mimics that problem, the greater the probability of us being able to improve it. And this, of course, will also increase your motivation, your results, and the adherence that you'll have, because we are worried that people are not going to do it for a long time. 
but if you are getting results, you will be able to do it. So, next slide, John. I just did it for you. Oh, so I would I would say that can we if we think about these daily activities, can we honestly train uh, going through doorways as an exercise routine? How about you know moving around in the couch as an exercise routine, on a bed? Any of these activities, can they be transformed into an exercise routine? So ultimately, I mean, the question that, that comes to our head is, can we create exercise programs that help you address a specific difficulty that you are dealing with? But here's the key is in, it has to be challenging and it has to be fun. Because fun is critical as you cannot, you, you can't design a great Parkinson specific program and then you won't do it because it's either too easy or it's too hard, or it's just not fun. There is a reason why people will prefer doing boxing than going to you know, the clinic and doing normal physiotherapy. And we must think about this so that we can change, right? Now, I wanted to show you here just a couple of videos that will, I would say it's my attempt to prove that this is possible. And it's my belief that if some people can do it, then I'm sure it has to be made possible for others. These are people that I follow, I would say ongoing. So it's people that are with me two or three times a week. And we have a specific goal. Imagine if it's like turning because someone is falling with turning and we will always be focusing on that goal, but doing it in different ways. Of course, this requires a lot of creativity for us to be developing new things all the time, but it's all the ingredients that we're putting into the exercise that will make that difference and keep people motivated. Now, I will share that I think in the last two Movement Disorder Society Congresses, I've heard things that uh, the recommendation for early stages uh, of the disease is to prescribe non-specific exercise. I hear this and I think, why would we be prescribing non-specific exercise if we can give people specific exercise? It doesn't really make sense to me as a health professional. And even if you think about it, even in stage one, if the person says, oh, I like to do ping pong as my exercise, that's fine. But even the act of ping pong can be probably um, adapted to what you need. So imagine that if you have no problems and it's just your left hand that is most affected in Parkinson, would you challenge yourself to play ping pong, ping pong with your left hand? that would probably make the difference between you doing it with your right, right? So the, the results that you can get if you adapt the exercise that you do, it will make the difference not only in terms of the problem that you're addressing, but also in the long term. Okay, so this project, the Bespoke Exercise Project, it's a grant funded initiative with the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania. And it was really inspired by the questions and the needs of the people with Parkinson's that we're interacting with. We start by asking people with Parkinson's to share a daily problem for which they'd like to have an exercise created. We create a routine, um, an exercise video, and we try it out a couple times on Zoom to make sure it's working. And then we share that exercise with others who might be dealing with similar problems to see if they can get benefit and get new ideas to treat what they're dealing with. Oh, there we go. Um, so the way we, we achieve this is really through four steps. First, we identify the problem and the factors contributing to that problem and studying possible solutions. Uh, together, we have a conversation, we define goals and a feasible working plan. Then we test the exercises uh, that we create and make sure that it's adapted not only to the problem identified, but also to the person and their environment. And the environment is a big factor. And then we make sure the exercises are available to everyone in the Parkinson Foundation's uh, YouTube channel. We're going to be doing a couple of examples here. Uh, uh, Joseph, I'm going to let you do the first one. Okay. 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 Right. Delta, I think there you go. You need to be muted. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, E Delta. Both okay. Time. So uh, we wanted to, instead of, you know, going to a lot of theory and just give you a practical example of how we've been applying this project and maybe get some key, um, I would say, messages out to you and see if it's useful. So we hope it is. Uh, we're gonna give you an example here with Fred, and I'm not gonna go into medical background. Uh, let's focus on the problem that Fred shared with us. 
And so he says, I feel unsteady when I stand up and try to take the first step, particularly in the evening. So he's trying to get out of the couch in the evening and he feels that he feels unsafe and he can't take the step or he hesitates in taking that first step. Now, taking the first step consists of a complex series of movements that are connected and strung together in a sequence. If one part of that sequence of, let's say, the muscle activation is interrupted, the whole movement can be compromised. And um, many times it can come to a stop or even, if, even for a few seconds. So basically what I'm saying is the automatic pilot in the brain stops us from giving that first step if it feels unbalanced. Now let's look at the video and uh, we can see, you know, identify like situations that might be causing this. So if, so Fred shared these videos with us, you know, just getting up from different places in, in his house. And there is a, t a tendency to, I would say, common tendency to have his heels are together. So notice where the feet are placed and how the feet are placed. In every situation that was sent to us, this was a common issue. So keeping your feet too close together will give you a feeling of unsteadiness. This is a key message. This will happen uh, when you're walking. This will also happen when you try to initiate movement, right? So taking that first step and now what, what happens is that you, your brain, it won't automatically remember to you know, separate your feet. So you can actually, you think about it. If you focus attention, you can obviously improve this. But this, it is difficult for us to concentrate on those type of details when we are getting up from the couch. Because if you think about it, what are we doing when we get up from a couch? We are doing normal things that would be, we lost in our thoughts. We are talking with someone, someone is talking with us. We hold a cup, we have a cup in our hand or we hold in the remote control. So usually this task is done under situations where you're not actually thinking about it, about where to position your feet. And now because you have Parkinson, you have to think about it. So this is uh, really a characteristic. And it's, it's, it's not enough for us to just teach you this. So you can hear this presentation and you can think about, okay, maybe I'm going to consider this uh, strategy where I'm going to separate my feet. But uh, what this will require for you is to actually train this in different and uh, challenging ways. Because again, what happens when you're getting up, those are the situations that you want to really mimic and to include in an exercise program. So here I wanted to share with you is like, how common is this problem, right? Is this a Fred's problem or is this really common in Parkinson? I, um, I said, I'm, I'm going to share with you. This. So these are photos that I was actually, I would say, entertaining myself in the coffee break of an event that I went uh, a year ago, I think. So from the Davis Finney Foundation Victory Summit. And there were about 600 people there and care, people with Parkinson and caregivers. And so... Um, I was amazed to see during the coffee break that as I looked down, I could actually identify people just by the way people with Parkinson, just by the way they had their feet. So I'm imagining David's thinking, I'm never going to invite her to ours, to our <laughs> events, um, I'm sure. But it was just it was just so overwhelmingly frequent that um, I, I was going around sitting on the floor taking pictures of, of people's feet, right? So we think about what is the goal. And so Fritz specifically said, I want to have less difficulty when I get up and try to walk. Okay. This was ultimately his goal. And we have to keep focused on that as we plan the exercise. The way we're going to approach this is really thinking about, okay, so what can I do about the environment? What can I do about the activity? And what can I do about the person's daily structure and his, his habits to be able to help him achieve this goal? This was the rationale behind the way we organized our, our thought. So if we share with you just a couple of things that we brainstormed on, and I would say some of them obviously, um, I would say intuitive, and you think about it immediately, right? Obvious. But sometimes it's good to just organize it. So what can we do about the environment? Of course, if you have a low couch, and most couches are really soft nowadays, 
and uh, not in Portugal, but uh, I can see in American there is. <laughs> so you'd say that increasing the height of the couch would obviously help you reduce the effort that you probably do when you're getting out of it. And so by this, you probably feel less stressed and unsteady. So this could be, I would say, an immediate solution, sometimes not as easy as we think because people will changing your couch or, or changing the environment sometimes is not really well received. Uh, in Portugal, especially because of, with women, don't like to change their houses. But I could suggest like putting some blankets underneath the main couch that's there, the, the main pillow of this couch would probably just raise it a few um, centimeters and that might be just enough to help reduce uh, that the, the stress. Um, I wouldn't suggest putting small pillows or another pillow because once you're trying to struggle yourself out of the couch, you would probably find it difficult to shift your weight forward if you have pillows, additional pillows on top of it. Another thing that we can do is also think about, can I reduce the distractions of the moment that I'm getting out? Um, and by this, I'm bringing attention to what I have to do with my feet, right? Uh, so distractions would be, maybe I can switch off the TV before I get up. Uh, maybe I can ask my wife not to talk to me when I'm getting out from the couch. Or even better, the stress factors, which is hurry up, dear, come to bed. You know, you know sometimes we say that very intuitively, um, and without thinking about the, F, the stress that it may cause. We can also think about other changes in the environment. And I'd say, again, if we think about the baseline problem is because you have Parkinson, your brain is not automatically putting you in the right positions for you to be able to do the movement. And so if I can have a reminder of, where, of how I should be placing my feet, uh, then that will probably help me reduce also the problem. Now I want to take a moment and I want to challenge you to stop what you're doing and I want you to look down at your feet without moving them just see how many of you have your heels very close to each other can I see hands up in here I hope I can't see you all so I hope someone's putting their hands up no I see some nodding <laughs> no so if if um if we think about strategies like placing some kind of what we call a cueing line. So it's just a cue. It's a, you can use some random tape just to remind you that as you shift yourself um, forward on the couch, that you will see um, something that will remind you to, oh, okay, I have to separate my feet. What we're doing here, it's, it's really a preventive strategy. So by doing this, all the rest will flow naturally and you don't have to think about anything else as you're getting up. This, will, this is enough to influence a better outcome without having to think about all the details and, and uh, apply more strategies. Oh, let's see. Now I do wanna highlight that when we ask someone to do something that they are not used to doing, they, it will be awkward. And I often say this to the people that I treat, if it feels awkward, that means it's right. Because they say, how much should I open? If it feels awkward, then it's probably right. Because remember that you are receiving um, information, you know, tactile information from your body that is distorted, that is different, that is altered because you have Parkinson, because of the rigidity that you have, right? So really without going into details, just you are being betrayed by your body, which is giving wrong information to the brain. And so by this, it's like when you are going to do a changing in this type of behavior, it's going to feel strange in the beginning. And as you do it more often, you will feel immediately safe. If you try this, just separating your feet and standing up, you will see that you feel much safer. You do it much quicker with much more strength because everything in your body is being applied in the best way, in mechanical way, right? Oh, sorry. So um, another thing that we can do is think about what can I change about the activity? And now for all of you that probably already went to uh, have been with a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist, this will be something that you probably hear very often which is let's break down the action itself. So standing up from the chair is now composed of uh, several um, small tasks, which you must remember in that order. And this is what we teach people. It's like, I want you to please first move your feet towards the chair, shift your hips forward. So we're breaking it really down into, and what I'm adding in here 
is separating the feet. So we do, it's critical to push your feet back in order for you to be, to pushing yourself forward and to be able to easier leaning forward and to get up. Now, I, uh, I don't think we've talked for long, but I would, I would suggest you try it, if not now, but to try it, uh, to see the difference what, that it is when you do this with your feet together and when you, your feet are apart, okay? So focusing on, uh, I would say, activity, tips that we can do for the activity, to change the activity is, on one side, we can think about these strategies to prevent it from uh, happening. So that means the line on the floor, maybe you've been taught things like count one, two, three, so that you can get up from the chair. So there are, uh, um, I would say several uh, strategies that health professionals teach you regarding how to get unstuck, right? Then we can also look at it is if it does happen, there is a whole other uh, strategies as well that can be taught to you in order to take that first step. And so I think these are very common things that we hear in Parkinson, which would be, okay, if you can't take a step forward, then take the step back with the same foot and then go forward. This is a very common one. Another one will be taking a step sideways and then going forward. So these are moments where you feel that your feet are uh, kind of stuck to the floor and you are hesitating, it's, it's almost like your brain is trying to decide which foot goes first. And this will be more severe if your feet are together because you feel more unsteady. And the, again, the brain will feel unsafe and he won't take that step. He's there actually to protect us, as you can see. <laughs> These are all mechanisms to protect us. Um, so I'd say uh, we can also think about things that we can change in, in the routine. So sometimes we will be, you know, watching movie until late, and then we decide to, to stand up. And in those moments, uh, we are probably already very tired. So choosing maybe if, if we are really suffering with this problem, choosing the hour in which maybe I'm going to actually go to bed or stand up and get up uh, might be uh, nicely correlated to when you're on periods. So by on periods is when the medication is actually making more effect. Um, so, of course, people are not going to be changing their time of medication. You can discuss this with the doctor if there's really a program on TV that you want to see until late. So that can be, I would say, negotiated usually with the neurologist. Say, do you think I can take a half an hour after or earlier so that I'm, I'm, I feel good when I get up from the chair and try to go to bed? Uh, so I think this is a valid tip to give, uh, to try to think about maybe I'll go half an hour before um, I'm struggling or I feel more, more tired. Um, so that I can have more a uh, reserve in terms of energy that we're using. And I would say our last strategy, which is really down to our uh, to the, the focus of our project, is really can we create an exercise that will help you reinforce these learning? Uh, so maybe we went through a bunch of strategies that you can use. And now let's try to have an exercise that will remind you um, every time you do it about separating your feet, how to place yourself when you're getting out from the couch and taking that first step. And so this was our, I'd say our mission um, here with Fred. And so this is what came for, out of it. So we're just gonna share a small glimpse of the video that we put together mm -hmm. for him. I am going to challenge you to lift up both hands and come back. Blue, blue. Exactly, so it goes up and it comes down. And while the blue is on, I am doing this. So that's my ex blue exercise. Blue exercise. Okay. When it is black, I want you to kick with your right foot and then with your left foot. So that means... With the right foot and the left foot. The red will be composed of two movements and I'll put the red slower when I give you the exercise, which will be this. So the red will be... Open and up. Open and up. Oh, okay. That's how we will reinforce the learning of opening up the feet.
six. Back. Again. And this time on your own. So we have. So I didn't want to talk over the video, but I just want to so share with you. It's like I would I wish I could see all of you to ask you, do you think this is something that you would do in an enjoyable way? I would dare ask. <laughs> this is me influencing the responses. <laughs> no, so um, so basically it's like, of course, enjoyment is defined differently for every person. Okay, so what Fred might find enjoyable might not correspond to you. But it is the therapist, uh, I would say, challenge for us to find something that works for you in a fun way, but that would also combine the results that we're looking for. Um, and what we were doing here, we are obviously adding in several ingredients to make it more and more complex because we know that complexity, intensity of training is part of ingredients that have to be in our exercise. And so by making it more and more challenging, we can, we can work up an exercise that's about 20 or 30 minutes per day and that we will that we, you are able to do uh, maybe for two or three weeks and then we change the exercise again right so i think this is just building the exercise according to what the person might tolerate um and i hope that if um some of you go in and i would say try it out so i hope you enjoy it very very yeah. interesting enjoyable and it was tough some of those exercises are different when you're trying new positions and uh, you're, you're trying to get rid of the old and bring in the new hard and some of them just just difficult because she made them that way <laughs> she makes some of them tough if it's too easy you won't do it uh, it's okay let's uh, i'll go along with anything i'll try it and I'll feed back the information, and you know I'll be truthful with you. <laughs> Thank you. You're you're very professional. You did a good job. I'm I'm glad for you too. Let me, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Fred, obviously, for all his um, tolerance to everything that we tried, and uh, <laughs> it's really great working with him. Yeah, truly, truly. Okay, so our next example we have Rick. Yeah, and I'll jump in here now. Um, before I do, I see somebody put something in chat. Is there anything I need to be addressing before we move along, guys? I'm, a, I'm leery of opening up a chat and maybe blowing our screen share. Uh, no, it's just I, I just put that in um, because uh, you were talking about the environment and there are furniture risers that if uh, folks need yeah. to get a little more elevation on chairs or uh, beds or sofas, you know, you can pick them up pretty quickly. And you would put that under the feet of the chair rather than actually manipulating the couch cushion. That's a good idea. That's an excellent one. Um, they'll, they'll make their way to Portugal eventually, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm feeling quite jealous here. <laughs> I'm sure we can get it on Amazon too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm amazed that I can get shipped from the United States to Portugal on Amazon. They're, they're quite good. All right. Well, I'm going to jump into it and uh, uh, let me just, without further ado, let me talk to you about Rick who, uh, who, had really great insights and had a number of challenges that we we really had to contend with. It was great. It was a challenging situation. So Rick starts by saying, you know, I have difficulty being heard and communicating fast enough. I've lost my, I can't get into the conversation many times because I can't think fast enough or get the words out quickly enough. Boy, is that's a common complaint that is as common a complaint I might hear in Parkinson's. And it has a couple of different factors that can be causing or at least contributing to it. So not surprisingly, quiet volume is so common that I would describe it as a clinical hallmark. It's something that I see in so many. Although if you go to the research and the literature, the hallmarks are usually motor symptoms, movement related symptoms, slow movement, mu muscle stiffness, tremor in people who have tremor in their Parkinson's and not everyone does. And then you get to the word finding in its own right. It's a very common problem as well. So there's really no surprises here. Um, what is surprising is that I often find the two are somewhat related because when you spend a lot of your energy trying to be loud enough to be heard, it takes the focus from what you're trying to say. And it increases some anxiety and contributes to uh, fatigue, which also diminishes the word capacity, the word finding capacity. So I think it's, it's a common complaint 
and um, we'll have a couple of different ways to address it as we get into it. Now, Rick is uh, bilingual. He's a fluent speaker of Spanish and had lived in the Dominican Republic as well as Venezuela. And this was a really interesting insight. He, he said that he noticed this, I think it was five or six years ago. It was, it was several years before he noticed it in his English word finding. Um, and, you know, you would only expect that because uh, a second language would be harder to keep track of. But it was a little bit of a canary in the coal mine, as I might say. Um, it gives us an interesting, interesting uh, other tool, just like Josefa likes to use English and go from uh, Portuguese to English uh, as a way of maybe adding some dual task load. Uh, this might be an opportunity for Rick, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, Okay, uh, again, uh, no surprises, right? <laughs> uh, uh, on occasion, I might find a spouse that might need some help with their hearing as well, but quite often uh, you would expect the spouse to be able to pick up on what's loud enough and Patty here is no exception. So, yeah, very much. So, now Rick has undergone uh, a previous course of LSVT loud, that's the Lee Silverman voice therapy with a certified clinician in your region. And he identified very good results. He was very happy with the program, but expressed concerns with his ability to keep up with the maintenance program activities. And he tells a funny story about trying to practice these when he was down in uh, the Dominican Republic, these loud exercises and then drawing a little bit of a crowd. And it's kind of funny because when I'm in Portugal, I mean, I practice my voice exercises more or less every day. I've been doing the vocal function exercises, which I'll be demonstrating later on for like two decades now, and I do them every day. Uh, Josefa, in her infinite wisdom and patience, has learned to accept it at home because we have a nice flat with thick walls and nobody can hear me. But when we're traveling abroad, or especially when we're traveling in Europe, I really try to calibrate things so I don't put her into an awkward cultural situation. Right? So I feel Rick's pain. <laughs> because if you are an American in another country, you're already too loud. <laughs> and uh, the exercises aren't going to help it. So I feel Rick's pain. Um, these are the goals that we came up with. They're pretty straightforward, but as you'll see soon, uh, the, there's a twist. Uh, before we go there, let's walk through some ways that we can improve the communication that don't involve direct exercise for the voice, although we're going to have those for sure. Uh, but just kind of borrowing from the, the metrics uh, that Josefa was using initially, we're going to discuss the environment and the activity and the daily structure Rick is using to help achieve that goal. And that's really going to be a valuable way to attack this. Um, so Josefa and I actually were on a call over the weekend, and I think she was trolling me a little bit because I was talking about how backlighting can be a real bummer, and especially if you're on a Zoom call. And so she popped up like this, and this is exactly she's demonstrating how not to do it. <laughs> and not only are her features are obscured, but uh, the brilliance of the white light that's behind her is going to overwhelm your vision and make it difficult for you to really focus anyways. It, it's a double whammy. Um, so being smart about your lighting can help you communicate uh, a lot uh, better. We use, um, you know, uh, eye contact for turn taking and for understanding whether someone's connecting with us and they understand what we're saying, or maybe they want to get some clarification. I always like to say that if you're making good eye contact for the communication, then you're probably close enough for communication because that allows you to uh, basically you have the right proximity. You're not having to shout too much. And if your spouse may or may not be having some hearing loss, um, you're not making it difficult for them also. So uh, getting yourself properly lit and then getting yourself in the right distance. And then for Zoom, and I won't get too far on that, but Zoom is the same thing. We rely a lot on being able to be uh, clearly seen as a way of being sure that people know that we're getting ready to talk. Although I do the finger thing all the time, it seems like now. I put, uh, and um, that's also valuable. I would like to not use it in face-to-face -face communication, but once in a while, it, it's valuable. Just really last part about this for Zoom, and then I won't get too far away from it. Um, if she had just turned herself around and had the camera, so she was facing the window, and she had the camera facing her that way into the room, that would have solved all these problems. And I would say that, you know, you can get some lights. We have a green screen studio down here and Josefa has some lights that we sent, but uh, you can do 90% of it with just good use of room lighting. And you might take those lessons when you're talking about one-on-one -on -one communication. So, you know, like when you're speaking with someone, if it's too dark, you might turn up the lights or you make sure that you're not backlit like that. 
Um, for those of you who may know me already, I am a nerd. I do like toys and technologies, and um, that's one thing that you can integrate pretty easily into your environment that might also help improve things, especially online. And uh, Rick specifically, we talked a lot. He happens to have an iPhone. I have an iPhone. And um, a lot of the stuff we were going to do was going to be stuff that he could use auditorily. And I recommended that he might consider getting some wireless ear pods, AirPods because uh, it'll be easier for him to capture that signal and it won't be so noisy. He, he exercises quite regularly and he does it in the morning. Um, I don't usually make specific brand recommendations, but I will say that I have tried uh, maybe a dozen different you know, wireless earbuds over the years. And for an iPhone specifically, I've really been very impressed with my Apple product because they connect very well. They are integrated well. Um, just to be fair, and so I'm not like, I'm not looking for an endorsement deal from Apple. I might say that a, a good equivalent would be the Samsung Galaxy, Galaxy Buds Pro, which also have noise canceling and the noise canceling is very valuable. Uh, we were in an accelerator earlier this year and they gave us this JBL set and I actually used them on camera for something that with Barbara Corcoran from uh, Shark Tank, which uh, was that that says a lot. They were willing to trust these. So anything like that's fine. But I'm going to say is if you have an iPhone and you can afford these, um, I have yet to have a problem with them for three months now. So that's one possibility. Usually I don't like having microphones really far away from my speech source. So these ear pods wouldn't normally fit that bill, but they seem to be pretty good. But what I would recommend when you're getting onto a Zoom call is to get some kind of gamer's headset. And I literally buy the cheapest one that has a 50 millimeter driver. And it allows me to put the microphone right in front of my speech signal. If you're more old school and you have the regular old uh, earbuds, it's the same kind of thing. This is the microphone right here, and you can put it in front of your mouth if you're on the phone with somebody and you, or you're on a Zoom call. And especially for, for uh, Rick, where he was dealing with a problem with someone speaking Spanish overseas, it can just be a valuable way to improve his ability to hear. My, I, my, my dad, I was telling a story before we got on the call, is in a writer's group. My father's going to be 80 years old next month, and he's using that writer's group uh, as one of his really strong social connection points. And uh, when I put a set of these earphones on him, it closed off all the outside sound and he, he it was immediate. It was amazing how well his interactions improved. And then um, for someone with Parkinson's, being able to have a microphone that you can really put right in front of your mouth can also be a great way to increase your signal strength and make you louder without necessarily focusing on the LSVT loud or the speak out kind of program. So those are two things I would say right off the bat. I, I already said name brand for one, if you happen to have an iPhone or a good quality one. But then for these wired ones, I'm literally buying the cheapest one I can find on Amazon. I think, you know, under $30. I make no recommendations for brands. And then finally, uh, that thing in the bottom right hand corner here, that's an external speaker and um, they're battery powered. Again, Amazon or other the vendors have millions of them out there and I can't really specifically recommend one anymore. But I do say that I have tried, oh, I'd say maybe a dozen or so of those over the years. I've, I have, for a while, I was sending the same one out to a lot of people. And the ones that have a microphone that has a wired headset, so it won't be, um, let me see if I can find one here. It won't be necessarily uh, a wireless version that they make those, but something that has a cable to it. Those seem to be the most uh, reliable I would love to have a good Bluetooth or wireless one for these portable speakers, but they they, they just seem to break down on me more. So I, I always tell people to just go with the old fashioned wired one and deal with the hassle. And these are really great. They're about the size of a box of raisins and they are uh, have a rechargeable battery in them. And they're great if you're going to be somewhere public where there's a lot of noise, you can just put it on there, put the headset on and it gives you extra decibels so you can keep up in the conversation. And if you are in a socially distanced environment with a mask on, you can, you can, again, you can put that microphone right in front of there and give yourself a nice signal. And so again, these are just some tools that you could use in addition to the exercises that we're going to introduce here in a moment. So as I mentioned before, uh, Rick is very consistent with his exercise. Um, he's put together a routine to address some specific issues, not all of them related to Parkinson's. And again, we're not going to go into anybody's health history here, but he's worked with some great therapists that are specialized in different areas. And he has a routine um, and that 
presents a little bit of a challenge for us because I don't want to overwhelm him with a whole new routine and a bunch of additional activities that'll be difficult for him to complete in conjunction with his current program that he's been doing for other things. So what I started doing, he has some stretching exercises that he does against the wall. And so I added in a lengthening breath, which is a concept from Pilates. I, I, I love Pilates. I'm certified in Pilates and about 85% of Pilates is not really great for Parkinson's. So I don't really use most of it just because the exercises aren't really beneficial. But this is one that allows him to get some strengthening of this musculature and open up the ribs a little bit and give him a better column of air. So it's a nice one he can add into a routine that he's already doing. And uh, that's, that's what we're hoping to do. And then I added on top of that, a resisted breathing exercise. Um, it's kind of like he's um, blowing the candles out, but kind of in a COVID safe six foot away <laughs> uh, kind of way. So he's blowing really hard. And again, that provides some additional resistive exercise that's not at all related to producing his voice, but it gives him better airway protection or better airway um, patency. So he, he basically has a better column of air and that helps improve his ability to communicate. Another reason why I like these two exercises is that they also help with posture and they keep you more upright and that's super valuable for communication because now you're keeping yourself upright, you're making better eye contact when you're communicating and you're pointing your audio signal towards the ears instead of down here or down in the belly or somewhere where if you're a little stooped forward. So I, I won't demonstrate those. I have a couple other videos in here that I will, but the idea here is not to build a new uh, mousetrap or a better mousetrap, but to just actually put something into what he's doing and make it more effective. Um, Joseph brought this up before, and again, I think it's something that our very valuable tools are these reminders, and they're often underutilized. Um, I know as a clinician, we get focused on getting great results that we're hoping you maintain and carry over, but uh, not taking advantage of a couple post-it notes or maybe a bracelet or even a spouse that's attuned to what's going on and giving you a little cue, maybe putting their hands up in the air, or making a meaningful look. Um, you're you're missing easy low-hanging fruit those reminders can help you just as much as getting ensconced in a new uh way to to be louder you know just she said before your brain's not going to automatically remind you that's where these other parts come in here making sure i'm missing any notes okay now rick added another wrinkle into the whole mix is that um, a lot of his exercises have him in a position against the wall or doing something similar to that. And so it means that he wants activities that he can incorporate without necessarily having to watch a video the whole time. And that's a, a good problem to have, but it made it more challenging. So I, I, what I did is I built exercises that you might listen to with the video and you'll see this. It's actually going to come. We're going to premiere it here in the next week. I'm, I'm just wrapping up the editing. Um, that uh, you might follow along with it. And then eventually you'll see that you can take the concepts and integrate them into the exercise without necessarily having to follow along with the video every time. And as he gets familiar, okay, my only caveat with that scenario, especially for people who are not Rick, um, is that I'd like you to make sure you're having a conversation with your physical therapist to determine when and where you might want to apply these components. I wouldn't add a significant cognitive load in the middle of a balance exercise um, especially if that's being implemented by a speech language pathologist. That's, you know, actually Rick showed me a great video of somebody who was working on uh, with someone in the Dominican Republic and one of them was awesome and I took it and the other two were things that were much more complicated and had balance components and I left them alone for that exact reason. Okay, I'm going to stop that there. Yes. So let me start first when rick was talking about the embarrassment he was dealing with uh with the loud I, I hear that a lot and it's kind of a it's a problem because those exercises are really important and um there's such a great body of data specifically for lsvt loud i mean they've been doing it now for almost 40 years they have four lines of nih funding and they have studies that are the highest level randomized double-blinded controlled i mean a, a level one evidence and so i don't want to get away from those but I do hear the complaint sometimes. I remember one time I had a, a, someone I was working with in Colorado and in her, in her condo, which didn't have the thick walls that we have in Lisbon, um, it was too, too uh, noisy and she would actually muffle herself with a pillow, although that adds a lot of load to, your, um, to the 
the pressure. So I, I came up with a different one. This is a set of exercises that I've been doing, and I'm just going to kind of run you through it. This is a super cuts. The actual video is, is separately uh, produced and longer, but I wanted you to see it. I don't know if any of you have ever seen these. This is a, a pretty famous vocologist came up with these. These are called vocal function exercises, and uh, we're going to have three components to it. So you're going to warm up, you're going to stretch out uh, the muscles here. It's going to be called the glides, and then we're going to do the power exercises. So the first one we're going to do is an E sound, but it's going to be very nasal. And you're going to hold it for as long as you can, but you're not going to be any louder than you need to be to make it a nice, clear sound. So don't shortchange it on sound, but don't overdo it. Okay, here we go. Ready? You're going from the low note to the high note, and then the high note to the low note. Uh, I'm going to use a word like whoop, whoop, to bring it up there, and you'll hear my sound is very sireny, and it has to do the way I'm, I'm This is why I like these exercises, the right here. Whoop. Good. Now we're going to go the other way. So we're going to start high, we're going to go low. The word is boo. So uh, the word is ol. It's like the word hole without the H. So first pitch is ho. Okay, that's a D or about a D. Okay, ready? So you're going to take a breath in. Ho. Again, uh, those exercises aren't intensive uh, in the way that the LSVT Loud or the Speak Out or even the Pitch Limited Voice pro program out of, out of uh, the Netherlands. Um, but they do a great job of strengthening the muscles, and I sometimes use them as an adjunct. I really love the way they focus on this frontal focus. You hear that, and so sometimes just getting used to making the glides with the with that buzziness is really valuable because I like to use that when I'm communicating. I always want to have as much sound as I can get with the least amount of effort. I don't want to necessarily fight for that last 3%. And um, it's kind of my take in, in speech therapy, but I do think it's something to add. And for Rick, it's something that hopefully doesn't have uh, the local authorities being called to his apartment if he's practicing in abroad. These are called vocal function. Sorry. And then uh, because this is uh, the triad and we do dual task exercise, that's what really we focus on movement and voice and cognition. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't let it go without having a little dual task. Um, so in the purest form, the activity will have you raising your right hand, as you say, a first letter of the alphabet, and then your left hand, as you say, the word that begins with that, and then both hands to make a short sentence. Uh, Rick was able to actually integrate this into other parts of his exercise, but let me, let me show you what it looks like here. And you're going to begin by saying the letter, and then you're going to say a word that begins with that letter, and then you're going to make a sentence that begins with that letter. And if you see, I'm putting my hands up each time. That's something you're going to have to keep track of. So, for example, if I wanted to uh, start at the beginning, I would say, A, antelope. I made chili out of antelope. It wasn't very good. Okay, so the idea is with the A, with the letter, that's where the power is. You're just going to work on that sound. A, A. And then you're going to come up with a word. Now, you're not going to stretch out that word. That'll sound crazy, but you're going to say, A, avocado. Avocados are getting pretty expensive. Something like that, right? And so I'm using a nice, clear, loud speech. 
And I'm also working a little bit on the vowel sounds. Might move really on. Really We're just looking at our time. I don't want to. B. Wait. Browns. I never expected the Browns to beat the Steelers. <laughs> right? Now, I'm from the land of the C. Bengals, so don't let me think you're catching. Cantaloupe. <laughs> I usually like cantaloupe over muskmelon, although I can't really tell the difference. And you're going to begin with here. Um, and then uh, some variations that we came up with was that he could also spell a word. He had plenty of, uh, of effort just going through the letters of the alphabet. You could start that, though, in different letters, or you could go in different directions. And then you could also take a word and spell it and do the same, same process where the first letter and then to make a word that begins with that letter. And then Rick turned that into something that was interesting with Spanish words and Spanish sentences. And the key with this, again, is that we're trying to make it something that he can integrate in conjunction with his current exercise. You can do this as a standalone exercise, and it's a fun one, but you can also add this to the routine that he's already doing. And that's really where the challenges were with him, but it's also where the cool opportunities were. So um, I'm going to probably, I think... And Dave, you might help me walk with through this. The foundation is going to be sending an email to people who attended with a form that you can fill out to talk about what kind of issues you're dealing with and maybe give us some ideas about what we could build with and possibly collaborate with uh, some of you in uh, the near future as we continue this project. But I think I'm going to pull my stop share here for a second and maybe we can talk about that a little bit and ask, answer questions. Um, thanks, John and Josefa. Um, that was that was really incredible. And if if you haven't seen John and Josepha on any of the programs or uh, symposiums that we've done, these guys are really on the forefront of you know this idea of dual task uh, or multitask exercise. When I started many 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 years ago, it was contraindicated to do anything but a little bit of exercise for folks with Parkinson disease. And now it's just been flipped on its head. And to, to watch what you guys are doing, it actually makes me sweat, not only because it's active, but I can't dual task. <laughs> Maybe we should test everyone on you first, David. <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, as John had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we've kind of partnered with them on a, a little bit of a pilot project here. And uh, Rick and Fred were the first participants in the pilot. Um, and we're still looking for some additional folks to work with John and Josepha. <laughs> I thought you were telling me. <laughs> yeah. And, and so if you have a particular challenge or a difficulty that you think they might be able to address, um, after the program today, you'll receive an email. And it'll just take you to a Google form with a relatively short questionnaire. And if you complete it and resubmit it, then we'll forward it on to John and Josepha, and they're going to be able to go through them and see which ones are uh, the best uh, that they can address appropriately. Is that good? That's excellent. Anybody have any questions or thoughts, concerns? Let's see, let uh, me something to tell me about. I'm from the land of the Bengals, so I don't think I can say anything about the sealers that you guys haven't already said. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add something, which is sometimes people might be afraid of what's this cognitive exercises and and doing it. It seems complex when you see a video, but it's a, in Parkinson, walking and talking became a dual task. And when you don't have Parkinson, it does. It's not a dual task. So it's it's not like we. It's it's a new thing. Unfortunately, because you have Parkinson, your automatic pilot is struggling. And so these things become dual tasks, talking with someone while you're getting out of the couch, which we wouldn't in normal life think it's a dual task. So it's, it's not about uh, walking and saying the alphabet in reverse, you know, completely out of usefulness. So uh, don't be afraid to, to, you know, to reach out to us. We will try to help the best we can. It'll always be fun, too. It's never going to be like we do in Colorado. <laughs> unless, unless you're a military person and you like it you know some people do enjoy it <laughs> uh, if you have questions that uh maybe john and josepha can uh answer you can just unmute yourself and ask the question um and to do that you can either click on the little uh speaker or uh just hit your space bar if you're at a pc or a laptop and that'll unmute you i see christine 
John, I'm just curious what Rick's reaction was at the end of this process and, and how he was impacted by the training. Yeah, I, I, and uh, I have those reaction videos. I'm still editing, but uh, he had a good outcome mainly because he was able to integrate it into his routine rather than I have a brand new something for you. And I think, again, uh, Rick is very disciplined and he's worked with some interesting healthcare providers internationally. So uh, it, being able to add something to his routine without necessarily taking him off his game was really valuable. And uh, he, I believe he's already got a set of these. These are on sale right now. They're, they're $180 down from 250. So I think he liked the tech support too, but that's a, that's a nerd thing. Oh, I think you're muted now, Christine. You had... Is he engaging more in conversation and finding success? Ooh. You know what? I can do one more video and maybe follow up because I'd like to know that. I mean, obviously that uh, situation on Zoom, we, we basically all take turns and we hold our fingers up. Um, I'd love to see him in an environment with either a big Zoom call like this or even better, a big group of people uh, properly masked and socially distanced outside. But I think that would be good to see. Good, 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 uh, good idea, Christine. Uh, yes, Norma. Do you, you um, need? To, here you go. Good. Yeah, the the question that I have um, is, uh, have you developed anything uh, for people turning a ninety degree corner? Um, like when I go from my sink to my stove, I have to turn ninety degrees. Um, and I struggle not to lose my balance if I don't do it very intentionally. Um, I, I would say, so I do a lot of house calls and usually people would like struggling in the kitchen from going around corners. So I think it would be something similar, learning how to turn, uh, to turn teaching people how to turn safer, safely, oh, the words aren't coming, um, safely. <laughs> I, I would say would be one of our greatest challenges as a physiotherapist when you're trying to teach this. But yes, this, this, this grabbing onto this concept of, can we change something about that corner specifically? Maybe we can use some cueing on the floor that can help you. Uh, maybe not have to think so much and focus so much attention as long as the, for example, if you have the lines there on the floor in a specific position, you just do it easily. Um, or, and then how can we organize what, what is around in that corner? What are you doing? So I think following the same structure that we did for, for Fred, uh, we can definitely try to, to create something for that. So passing from things that you can do about the environment, you know, think it, maybe the activity itself, and maybe if you want to add in um, an exercise that will help you better with that. Steve? Oh, you're muted, Steve. You just press your space bar or unmute yourself. I don't know if I can unmute somebody from here. I don't, yeah. If you press and hold your space bar, it's like a push to talk switch. There you go. There you go. He's got okay. it. I, I have uh, problems. I have a number of problems with uh, uh, swallowing and remember to swallow. And, and uh, if I'm working a task, I have my mouth open. So I've discovered if I smile, but, but it helps. But I, my natural... Uh, or if I get involved with something, my mouth's open. Yep. So I don't know how to realize that my mouth is open other than my wife saying, your mouth's open. <laughs> if she's not there. And so if it's one of my biggest challenges now. So well, I'm going to pull up an app here. Yeah. Are you on a, on a smartphone at all? Yes. There's a, a company out of the UK called swallowtools.co. I'll maybe find the link and send it to David. And um, I've very successfully, they have an app that basically beeps uh, every 30 seconds, minute, two minutes. And it's just a reminder. It used to be something I had to buy out of a big catalog, a big Salmon's Preston, but now it's an app for about two bucks with a Bluetooth and you probably don't want to have it on all day long because you'll acclimate to it. But when you're having that time when maybe you're you're noticing it or your wife is noticing it and telling you, put it on and you keep it there. And as it beeps, it's a, it's a space retrieval kind of um, reminder. It, usually when I have this in a situation where I'm working one on a one on one in a clinic, I'll put that timer on myself. We'll do activities. And then uh, as it goes off, uh, we'll see if you can remember to do it 
more and more regularly. It's a training okay. thing. That's also the, where I think some of Josepha's ideas about uh, uh, reminding with post-its and stuff like that can also be valuable. But I, I'm just going to see if I can find the app uh, right here because I, I use it a lot. Yeah, it's called Swallow Prompt. I don't know if you can quite see it here. And it's from a company called Speech Tools. And David, I'll send you that link. Um, and you just you pair it up here. And it's a nice tool for, um, I'm assuming, are you dealing with a little bit sometimes with some saliva getting out of, the, out of there every now and then? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You, you know, uh, where Josepha is doing her PhD in the Netherlands, I, I've done some uh, teaching with their speech language pathologist, uh, Hanneke Kalf, and her dissertation was on, uh, on sialuria, on drooling. And so she gave me her dissertation uh, one day when I was flying back on the plane. That was a great way to keep people from trying to talk to me on a plane because I got a big drooling in Parkinson's <laughs> book. Um, but uh, her, 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 her thesis went through a bunch of pieces of it. And people that have an open mouth, and particularly if they're a little bit forward leaning, they're at the highest risk. We obviously know that. And that's exactly what we start to try to address. Postural, keep you more upright and not forward so that if you have trouble. So there's ways to address it, I guess what I'm saying, but I like this tool a lot because it's, it's, it works as second, second you turn on, it's like delayed auditory feedback. If it's, if it's going to help you, it's going to, it's going to help you. Right. right. So that you said, uh, how would I get that information? Is that sent to David or? I, I, I mean, I can dig it up real quick, but I think uh, David, if you, if you, if I gave it to you, would you be able to get it to Steve or do you want me to give you a contact or maybe? Yeah. 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 yeah, and if you have it right now, we can even just stick it in the chat and folks yeah. can grab it. If let me let me let me just pull up. I, I, I'll it'll take me four seconds here because I, I look at it all the time. And here's the Swallow Prompt app, and yeah, speech speechtools.co. I think it's a, a UK company, and I'm going to put it in the chat right here. So okay, um, to everyone in the meeting, um, it's two or three dollars. It's not ridiculous. Some, some some people when they get a medical app, they get greedy. These people are pretty good. They have a whole range of tools. No, that's 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 where so my it, wife is very good at this. I'm not. Yeah. I, once you get set up, as long as again, as long as you have the Bluetooth, you can use it with a wired one. But again, I just like the freedom of being able to have one of these in and then uh, know that I can hear everything like uh, that. Um, so that's where I would start. And um, again, if you have an iPhone, I have a hard time not recommending this, although I used to buy the cheapest Bluetooth I could find and just figure I was going to run them through. And now I'm, I'm changing my opinions. Okay. I have no endorsement deal with Apple and I'm not looking for one, just so we're clear. Uh, it's called okay. speech tools. Dot CO. Swallow speech. prompt. Steve, well, if you if you click on the chat box, um, you'll see a message from John, and there's the link right there. And if you just click on the link, that'll take you right to it. We don't. We haven't done this on a cell phone before. Our oh, you're on a phone. cell phone. Okay. We've done it on our computer before, but our electricity was out for four hours and came back on while we were trying to watch you on the okay. cell phone. Well, I'll tell you what, I will just shoot you a quick email right after the uh, program with the link. Okay. And you have my email address? Yeah, if you got registered for the uh, webinar, then we must have it. Okay. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. You're welcome. Good luck. And I'll smile so I won't drool. <laughs> Sometimes a little ice chip, if I'm going out in the community and I know I'm going to be going to the bank or something like that, which I guess is not really happening as much these days, but... Uh, something to occupy my mouth. What you're doing with the smile, it helps a lot. A little. I don't like gum very much. I don't. I don't think it helps very much. But uh, something to occupy your mouth will, will also make you manage that saliva a little bit more. But also blinking, blinking, Blink. blinking. with your eyes. Yes. Because I, 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 I've lost the. I have to think about blinking. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's common too in Parkinson's and everything happens at a lower frequency for sure. Yes. Well, you get two apps, you get two phones, you get one set and one, you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the high one is for your blinking and no. Okay. So maybe that's an app I'll build one day. I have this trailer behind me that has all the information that I need. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good to talk to you, Steve. Thanks for giving me an easy one that I can solve. But all we can work. 
Anyone else have any questions? No. Well, thank you, John and Josepha, for hanging out with us a bit today. Oh. And uh, thank you for the work that you're doing with and for us. And all the folks, I will send that email right after um, we're finished here today. And if you have an interest in participating in the project, just like I said, uh, reply to the survey. We'll make sure John and Josepha go through them all and pick out the ones that are probably the most appropriate. Great. Thanks, folks. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good day. Be safe. Oh, and let me tell you also just a real quick story about John and Josepha. They were married last <laughs> spring. And right after their honeymoon, um, the pandemic hit and Josepha headed back to Lisbon and John has been stuck in the United States. So they've been married almost a year now and haven't seen each other in just about that amount of time. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Shame on you. That is a true casualty of this pandemic. We have, to put, we have to put John in a cage. <laughs> Don't give her any ideas, please. <laughs> we'll have to remarry when we get here. I love your, I love your accent. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Very. All right. Well, we uh, will sign you, off everyone. for today. Um, if you guys haven't checked out all the exercise programs that are going to be starting next week, just shoot um, shoot over to our website, hit on the calendar, and you'll see some fantastic classes. They're all virtual, they're all live, and um, they're done by fantastic instructors from our area and beyond. So make sure you get signed up for those too. That's a really cool project. I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. My you know.